Here I'm looking at the question of women doing ministry. This is general, although I think it has implications also for more particular kinds of women's ministry. Sorry, I can't be with you in person while I'm sharing this, but I'm grateful to be able to share it somehow. So looking, first of all, at Paul's teachings on women's ministries. Now, evangelical Christians hold a range of views in this. We can dialogue about them based on scripture. One practice that's unethical, however, is to misrepresent fellow Christians, uh, whether they use the label evangelical or not. The Bible is very clear that slander is dangerous. Romans 1, 30 to 32. Slanderers deserve to die, Paul says. Some accuse all those who disagree with them of disagreeing with the Bible. Denying the authority of Scripture to support women in ministry is indeed bad, but most of those who have affirmed women in ministry have done so because we affirm Scripture. A majority of women ministers around the world actually affirm the authority of Scripture, and that's certainly true among many holiness, Pentecostal, and other circles, who some say have constituted the majority of supporters of women in ministry. I recently transferred my ordination to the Assemblies of God. More than, well now, 28% of U.S. Assemblies of God ministers are women. The Assemblies with more than 80 million members worldwide is certainly not liberal. So dismissing those who support women in ministry as liberal is just a slander. It's not a biblical argument. When God pours out the Spirit, his daughters prophesy, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, quoting Joel about something characteristic about the eschatological time, the end time, which is the time in which, according to Acts 2, we live. I mean, the time before the very end, but you know what I mean. And it's happened some earlier times in history when God has poured out the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> just briefly, Oxford University Press has published uh, a book on some ordained women in early centuries, just publishing the inscriptions that, that show this. But uh, a vast greater number we've seen from the 1700s and 1800s in the US, we had an increasing number in Methodist and in other circles, um, pe people influenced by John Wesley and, and so on. We have a Pentecostal woman megachurch pastor in the 1920s. In fact, when my wife and I moved into the house where we now live, we found out afterwards that it had been owned by a missionary couple who had, had worked with Christian and Missionary Alliance in uh, Congo, Kinshasa. And before the wife in that couple had gotten married, she actually was a Baptist pastor in the U.S., um, maybe close to, maybe not 100 years ago, but somewhere like that, a long time ago. Part of the disagreement over, you know, Bible-believing Christians saying this or that is because different texts in the Bible seem to point in different directions. Bible-believing Christians on different sides of the issue often read only certain texts while ignoring others. Well, where does the biblical evidence point? Kind of depends on where you start. If you look in favor of women's ministry, uh, in terms of women speaking God's message, well, we have women prophets. You have Miriam, Huldah, Deborah, Isaiah's wife is called a prophetess, Anna, Philip's daughters. Acts 2 talks about it. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about it. You also have, regarding authority, a woman judge, Deborah, judging all of Israel. You say, ah, it's for the Old Testament. Well, you think it's going to be less in the New Testament? But anyway, a woman apostle, Junia. We'll look at some of these in more detail. Women as Paul's fellow workers and ministers, or at least the word that's often translated that. Now, against women's ministry, we have two texts. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, and 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Both require women to keep silent. So, do they minister the word of the Lord in sign language? You know, how, how do we fit these together? 
But if the issue was simply decided by the number of texts or the percentage of texts, it would be those who oppose women's ministry who deny the Bible. Now, obviously, those who oppose women's ministry believe they're not opposing the Bible. But the point is, if we're going to support all the Bible, we need to read all the texts and not just our favorite ones. Can we account for the different views within Paul's own writings? Well, uh, you know, in assuming that Paul is consistent in some way, you can say, well, Paul was against women's ministry in general, but he allowed exceptions for women he knew were doing the work well, in which case we should at least allow exceptions today as well. Another possibility is that Paul was for women's ministry in general, but limited it for exceptional situations. So like the cultural situation, this is to say, if Paul had been around today, Paul would have said, no, uh, women aren't unable to teach. It's obvious women can teach. So let's, uh, let's take that into account that it's different from the setting in the first century where women normally weren't allowed to teach anywhere uh, with, with men. And they normally also couldn't, uh, couldn't learn beyond a certain level unless they were really elite. So I'm going to argue for the latter view, that it was for exceptional situations. Now, one other approach that's often taken today is that Paul allowed some kinds of ministry, but for bad others. This is kind of halfway in between. Um, it's usually claimed to be the view only of those who are against women in ministry, but it's, it's kind of halfway in between. But anyway, most advocates of this approach allow women to preach and teach, allow them to counsel. They can do everything except be senior pastor, or in some circles, they can do all the work as long as they're not called pastor. But the problem is that the texts that they use don't say she can't be senior pastor or can't be called pastor. They say she has to be quiet in church and not teach. And besides, she can be an apostle or a prophet, but she can't be a pastor. Or she can have authority over all of Israel like Deborah did, but she can't be a pastor of what in the first century were mostly house churches. First Timothy 2.11, women have to be quiet in church. Now, if that means all that it could possibly mean, then women shouldn't be participating in congregational singing. If women are singing in your church, does that mean your church is liberal? But it can't mean that, because women can pray and prophesy in church, and Paul says that very clearly. So he can't be talking about all kinds of silence. So everybody who wants to quote this text, if you want to believe the context of the rest of Scripture, even the rest of Paul's letters— if you let women sing in church, then you have to agree that First Timothy is addressing a more specific issue. So if we, most of us agree on that point, then what we need to do is explore what kind of issues are really being addressed. First Timothy 11, uh, 2, 11 and 12, it's actually the only passage in the Bible that might prohibit women from teaching the Bible, if that's what it does. It doesn't say they can't pastor. It says they can't speak. In fact, they can't make noise at all, technically, if it calls for silence. But it, it happens to be in the only series of letters where we specifically know that false teachers were targeting women with their teachings. 1 Timothy 5.13, Paul warns younger widows not to go from house to house as gossips and busybodies, many translations say, the term translated busybodies normally means speakers of nonsense, spreaders of false ideas or doctrines. Gordon Fee pointed that out to me some years ago. I asked him, could you show me your evidence on it? So he sent me a printout of every use of the word in extant Greek literature. That was pretty convincing. Paul speaks of false teachers in 2 Timothy 3.6 who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women. Isn't it a coincidence that the one place where women's ministry is restricted is the one place where we specifically know 
the false teachers were targeting women to spread their teachings. So why would we start with this passage and ignore all the others where Paul affirms the ministry of his women colleagues? Almost no circles in the ancient world, Roman, Greek, Jewish, allowed women to teach. Just a handful of women teachers in all of antiquity appear. Uh, there, there were some who taught men, but you know, over the course of like 800 to 1,000 years, we can probably, the ones we, we can name actually doing the teaching with men uh, could be named on probably my 10 fingers or maybe 20 fingers if I had them. So it was common to speak in general terms about no women teaching or exercising authority. Some don't think we should take cultural background into account, but that's inconsistent hermeneutically. In other words, you can't interpret the Bible consistently that way. What if we pressed all texts to make them mandatory without taking into account their cultural situation? 1 Timothy 5.23, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, I sometimes have indigestion, but I use, I use tums or you know, something like that. Should we use only wine when, when we're sick? How many of you sent an offering for the church in Jerusalem last week? That's explicitly commanded in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Your church didn't do that? I'm through with you. You're liberal. Oh, uh, what about 2 Timothy 4.13? When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, how many of you have ever tried to obey this direct command of Scripture? To obey this, you would have to go to Troas, excavate Troas, find the, the right first century cloak, assuming it survived, assuming Timothy didn't already get it, assuming you could tell it was Paul's. I mean, only one person at most can fulfill this command. And once you've got the cloak, how do you get it to Paul? He's dead. And if you laughed, that's sick. You shouldn't laugh at, at somebody being dead. But anyway, this is why we need to take into account letters' original situation. You say, well, those cases are absurd. Does it really have to be absurd before we say, okay, let's take into account the situation? If you're going to interpret the Bible consistently, you need to do that consistently. If you're reading the Bible enough, you'll see that Paul addressed specific situations a lot. Like, try reading 1 Corinthians all the way through, for example. You have to make the right analogies before you apply his inspired message. Now, I believe that the transcultural principle in 1 Timothy 2 is not that women shouldn't teach, but that easily deceived people shouldn't teach. In our culture, as opposed, well, in Paul's, it could be either one too, but in Paul's culture, the women were most vulnerable to that. But in our culture, maybe men or women, whoever lacks access to adequate biblical understanding. Since Paul elsewhere does affirm women's ministry, it makes sense that 1 Timothy 2 is addressing a local situation. At least that's what I'm arguing. So if you disagree with me, um, you can either stop watching the video or you can say, I disagree with you, but yeah, okay, I'll listen to what you, you have to say. It's all right. I love you anyway. Either way, um, I'll return to 1 Timothy 2 if there's some time at the end. But first, here are some of the biblical arguments that support women in ministry. Now, I could go into more detail addressing objections. I wrote my second book on this. It was one of my more controversial books. Actually, it was probably my most controversial book. Um, well, at least for the first 20 years or so. But for the sake of time, my focus for now will be on passages where we see women doing ministry of God's message. In Scripture as a whole, so that's including the whole of the canon, the most prominent ministry of speaking God's message actually belonged to prophets, people who prophesied what the Spirit was giving them to speak for God. Well, the Bible has a lot of prophetesses. They're not, they're not the majority of prophetic figures, but we do have a number of them, and some of them are very prominent. Miriam was a prophetess. She led all of Israel in worship in Exodus 15. All Israel waited for and mourned when she died, 
Huldah was the most prominent prophetic figure in this part of Josiah's reign. And Josiah sent to her exactly as Hezekiah had sent to Isaiah for the word of the Lord a century earlier. Isaiah's wife is called a prophetess. Deborah. Now, Deborah is both a prophetess and Judges 4.4 4 says that she's a, she's a judge. She's a woman judge. I mean, it makes note of the fact, as if we couldn't tell, but it makes note of the fact but not not demeaning it, just you know, noticing it. This is unusual. But look, she's one of the few judges on whom we have no dirt. I mean, Samson, you've got a lot of a lot of dirt. And Gideon, some things didn't turn out to right uh, later on after his victory, and, and so forth. But she constitutes not just one of the judges on whom we have no dirt, but she con constitutes 50% of the prophet judges. That's her and Samuel. And prophetic judges are probably the closest Old Testament equivalent to New Testament apostles. Well, okay, make her one third if you include Moses as a, as a judge. Um, but Moses is a leader of Israel and a prophet. Samuel and Deborah as leaders of Israel and prophets. And then you have some other prophetic type leaders like David, Elijah, and Elisha afterwards who were in the judges category, but close enough to the idea. I think they also give background to what New Testament apostles are like as um, they encourage the flourishing of prophecy further. But did Deborah not communicate God's word with authority? Luke Acts tends to, to pair genders and parables and healing accounts and so on. Well, Simeon and Anna are prophetic figures in Luke chapter 2. Acts chapter 21, you have Agabus, who appears earlier in Acts 11, Agabus and Philip's four daughters. And it fits what Acts 2, a programmatic statement for, for the book of Acts, your sons and daughters will prophesy when the Spirit of God is poured out. So we can expect, especially in cases where God's Spirit is moving, we're going to have more women sharing in the ministry of speaking what God is saying. Uh, and, and of course, you have other people who heard from God. We may not call them prophets or prophetesses, but like Rebecca heard from God, really would have saved Jacob and Esau a lot of trouble if Isaac had listened to what Rebecca heard from the Lord earlier on, assuming that she told him. Paul himself acknowledges that women may and do pray and prophesy in church. He says, as long as their heads are covered, Wish he'd said the men's heads could be covered so you wouldn't have to see how bald I am. But hey, no, he says the women's heads are covered. Well, here are objections to this. Men outnumbered women in prophecy. That's true. But that doesn't mean you can throw away the ones who are mentioned. Given the culture, what's surprising is that we have so many women. And there was never a quota that excluded them. And another objection people sometimes raise is that teaching is higher in rank than prophecy. So, yeah, they can prophesy, but teaching, it's only for men. Paul does not say that teaching is higher in rank than prophecy. In fact, the only passage in which he ranks them is 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where he says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then everything else. Now, as a teacher, I am very fond of the idea of teachers having some uh, important role in the church. So I'm not playing down teaching. Obviously, that's what I do. But, uh, <clears throat> and, and there are different kinds of teaching, different levels of prophesying as, as you go through the Old Testament too. I mean, Samuel mentoring a lot of people, Elijah and Elisha and so on. But here's the other thing. Uh, well, two other things. One is that elsewhere in Paul's writings where he does list gifts, even though he doesn't rank them, prophecy is still higher than teaching uh, in, in Romans 12 and in Ephesians 4. But here's the other thing. You would let women speak God's message as long as they don't use the Bible? Does that make sense? Prophets often did teach and often drew on earlier scripture and what they said. Now, if you're addressing a culture where most women are illiterate, 
then maybe you would say, okay, they're not likely to do this. Or where most women don't have Bible training and you have a number of men who do, maybe you'd, you'd say that. But that's not true in our context today. Given all the prophetesses in the Bible, can we possibly exclude women from proclaiming God's message? And, and the principle holds true whether you believe in prophecy in the original sense or not. I mean, they were proclaiming God's message. Or whether you believe in it for today, see, even though I do, not everybody does, but that's a completely separate question. Paul says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who've been in prison with me. They're outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Now, Junia is clearly a woman's name. Some translations don't get that right, but it was always a woman's name in ancient texts. Some people have said, ah, it's a contraction for the male name Junianus. That's a contraction that nowhere occurs, and it doesn't even work. It's a Latin name, and that kind of contraction doesn't work in Latin. The most natural way to take the phrase, now this is a bit more debatable, but still this is the strong majority of scholarship would say this. The most natural way to take the phrase is that Junia is an apostle alongside Andronicus. Probably she's his wife, their husband, wife, apostolic team. Paul nowhere appeals to the opinion of the apostles as a group. So it's not likely saying, you know, the apostles think she's great. Greek speakers, this was their own language, such as John Chrysostom, recognized that she was being called an apostle here. And this is John Chrysostom, who's writing in late antiquity where they didn't have a lot of women in, in well, women ordained anyway. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe as virgins or something, but not as, uh, not, not normally to speak, at least in the Roman Empire. We can't arbitrarily reduce the significance of apostleship here. There are, there are some writers in the Bible who use apostle only for the 12. Obviously, she's not one of the 12, neither is Paul. But Paul uses the term in a broader sense, which is, I assume, the sense he's meaning here, not one of the 12. Uh, the only time where Paul Paul means it in a like special sense, like a messenger of a church, he specifies that. Paul doesn't limit the use of the phrase to the 12. He includes himself, including in this same letter, Romans, includes Timothy and, and Silas in 1 Thessalonians. He includes James in Galatians 1.19. Uh, he includes Barnabas, apparently, in 1 Corinthians 9. Even Luke includes Barnabas and Paul as apostles once in Acts 14. Are these lower than elders or pastors? The only reason for changing the meaning here, <laughs> when you don't have any other clues to this, is the assumption that a woman can't be an apostle, which is assuming what one is trying to prove, because the text by itself says she's an apostle. Can women be apostles and prophets? And I think there's no disagreement on the prophets part in the Bible, but not pastor teachers. Again, Paul usually lists them higher especially when he ranks them? Well, some object, then how come we don't have any women named as pastors? That's true. No woman is specifically called poimain, pastor, in the Bible. How many men are specifically named as poimain, pastor, in the Bible? Jesus. Um, and Peter speaks of you know, those who are to shepherd God's flock and speaks of himself as one of them. So I guess you could say in First Peter 5, maybe. But in terms of a man, a man called pastor specifically, zero. That's a really weak argument. Now, those you, you might guess would be pastors who presumably held that role. They're not called that. Instead, they're called other terms. But those other terms also are applied to women in Paul. Now, men outnumbered women, no problem, no question about that. But does that mean that we should deny that any were ministers? <clears throat> the two most common terms Paul uses for his fellow ministers are diakonos, which can mean servant or often rendered as minister. Sometimes it means deacon. 
whatever deacon was in the first century. That's another debate, First Timothy 3. It's actually a debate I won't weigh in, despite my sometimes willingness to speak on controversial questions, because <laughs> there are reasons it's controversial. I mean, the, the evidence is kind of slender for the first century. But anyway, whatever it meant, that's what it means in First Timothy 3. But wherever else we can determine its meaning, Paul uses it for his own ministry or that of his colleagues, usually his traveling companions, who were naturally male since he wasn't married. But he applies it to Phoebe in Romans 16, 1 and 2. She's a diakonos of the church at Cancria, and she's the one he sends the letter with, recommends her to the Romans. And normally, if you didn't understand the meaning of a letter, if you had questions, you'd ask the letter bearer. Uh, Paul puts Tychicus in that role elsewhere, and we have other evidence for that in antiquity. So, you know, she may have been the first person outside of Paul and maybe Tertius who's writing it down. She may have been the first person to explain it in Rome or explain parts of it in Rome. Also, Paul's other term for a fellow minister is fellow worker, sunergos. And Paul applies this to Prisca and Aquila, again, a husband and wife ministry team. He commends their ministry. They were leaders of house churches. Acts 18 says that they team taught Apollos. So it's like seminary professors with a young minister, although it was private tutoring in that case. Romans 16 greets twice as many men as women, but commends twice as many women as men. So per capita, you know, the women are getting commended like four times as often. I commend you our sister Phoebe, a diaconess of the church, Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers, Mary who worked very hard for you, which is usually a ministry phrase in Paul, the working, Junia the apostle, Tryphena and Tryphosa, uh, their, their names probably suggest they were sisters, maybe twins. These, these women, who work hard in the Lord. My dear friend Persis, another woman who's worked very hard in the Lord. Paul commends more women in ministry than men. Now, that's not to say we should establish a quota where you know more women should be allowed to be ministers than men, but I'll get to my point soon. Uh, although that would be, you know, kind of a uh, turnabout for people to say, well, no, you've got more men ministers than women, so can't have as many women as ministers. But anyway, I plead with Euodia and Suntaika, these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the Book of Life. Now, they're having some strife. There's some division in the church in Philippi. Paul has to urge them to work together. But they did work together with Paul earlier in the cause of the gospel, in the in the work of the gospel. Paul says that in Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3. Now, notice where, where he's commending women in ministry most, especially Romans 16 and Philippians 4. Rome and Philippi were two of the locations in the Roman Empire where women had the greatest freedoms. Is it possible that women are more apt to pursue ministry where the opportunities for them are more open? And is it possible that we have more work to do for the kingdom and need as many labors for the harvest as we can get? I mean, like, especially if you're in a culture that welcomes the ministry of women, or at least doesn't oppose it any more than they oppose the ministry of men, then why not? Paul seems to have not thought that was a problem. But what do we do with the two texts that many take to prohibit women's ministries. 1 Corinthians 14.34, women should remain silent in the churches. It's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. 1 Timothy 2, they need to learn quietly. I don't allow a woman to teach. And something, there's a debate about the exact meaning uh, that we'll have to mention. But anyway, uh, or did it have authority, usurp authority over a man, whatever that means. Uh, again, we'll have to talk about the debate in a while. But she has to be quiet. Keep in mind that almost no one today actually practices this fully. Again, even those most adamantly opposed to 
women's ministry of the word usually allow them to sing in the choir or at least in their seat. Sometimes they can even make announcements, but Paul requires silence. Perhaps they sing silently. Maybe they lip sync. How about praying or prophesying silently? 1 Corinthians 11, 4 to 5. You can't simply quote these two texts without explanation to prohibit women from pastoring. It really prohibits a whole lot more than that if you take it to mean all it can mean. If you take it to just mean pastoring, you're kind of arbitrarily limiting the meaning of it. But, you know, uh, you're closer to my position than you would be if you made them not say anything in church. Are these passages contradicting what Paul says elsewhere? Some people think so. Um, but I think they can be explained relatively easily otherwise. Um, I think it's it's more, more simple, more economically simple to take it that Paul would hold a consistent view and that we're misunderstanding one group of texts. Now, again, the people who say it's not Paul, there are reasons why they say these two passages are not Pauline. I'm not going to go into those, not because they're not worth talking about, but just because it will take a lot of time. And it's not really relevant to the discussion of the people who argue that women can't be ministers. So look at 1 Corinthians itself. Paul can't be mandating all kinds of silence because he earlier allows women to pray and prophesy, which can't really be done silently, at least not so far as we know. And they certainly couldn't write a note and pass it if most of them didn't know how to read, which was the case. I mean, most people in antiquity couldn't read, but at least couldn't read very much. And certainly even fewer of them could write. But in urban areas like Corinth and Ephesus, there would be more, <clears throat> but far more men than women. Anyway, this is a letter to Corinth. Paul and the Corinthians know what issue he's addressing, but how can we tell? Uh, I'm glad this isn't a case quite like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. Oh, and by the way, if you want to figure out the rest of what I'm talking about, it's what I told you when I was with you. Oh, that doesn't help us. But anyway, here, uh, you know, we get a little bit of, of clues. He gives us a clue. They're not allowed to speak. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. He connects it specifically to them inquiring about something. So the one kind of speech Paul specifically addresses here is asking questions. You say, what in the world is that about? Oh, you're asking a question? Well, how was that relevant in church? It was customary for people in antiquity to interrupt public lectures with questions. I actually, you know, I, I could see this had to do with asking questions, just, you know, studying 1 Corinthians on its own. But it was one day when I actually read, uh, I was reading through an ancient essay on lectures when it struck me, you know, how much it talks about people interrupting with questions. And after that, you know, I found it all over the place in ancient literature. It's true in Greek and Roman lectures. Jewish rabbis' lectures, it was also true there. Presumably, likewise, in church discussions, again, in house churches, you know, even, even the biggest rooms, um, maybe not in the villa outside of town, but normally the biggest rooms couldn't hold more than 50 people. And if you lived in one of the poorest places, actually, you just had enough room to stretch out and sleep. But anyway... The one kind of question that was considered rude, though, was unlearned questions. So, okay, how would that relate? Why would it be the women who would be asking unlearned questions? Is it a genetic issue or is it an environmental issue? Is it heredity or is it culture? Do women have lower IQs than men? Is this a genetic problem? Ah. If only they had a Y chromosome, they could they could discern what is what is true and right, and then speak accurately and teach teach properly. Or were women less educated than men? Now, even in upper class homes, 
women were rarely educated beyond 14 years of age. That is, they didn't normally go on to tertiary education. And in terms of secondary education, most women didn't get it because upper class homes were extremely rare. There were some very educated women in antiquity, but they were exceptions. So there were even a handful of women philosophers, but they were a small minority, especially those who would teach. We, we know barely any who would teach. And in terms of rhetoric, we don't know anybody who's trained in rhetoric until like a couple centuries later. But I mean, we have we have barely any people who would teach in this. And, and even a couple of centuries later, I mean, I'm thinking of one person. So it's it was very rare. Uh, you've got Sisypatra and, you know, women could attend synagogue, but they couldn't study the Torah in depth. Rabbis didn't train women in the Torah. Now, of course, most, most men weren't trained in the Torah as disciples either. Uh, but even, even in terms of picking up a lot of a lot of uh, Torah training, like Beruria, she was an exception. She's a late second century wife of Rabbi Meir, the daughter of a rabbi. She knows a lot uh, in the earliest sources about domestic halakha, uh, you know, household rules for taking care of the household. But she was kind of like, if you ever saw the movie Yentl, she was kind of like Sholem Aleichem's portrayal of Yentl. You know, she knew the Torah, but nobody would listen to her. So boys were taught to recite the Torah. Girls were not. So this, this goes beyond just those trained under a rabbi at, say, a tertiary level. This means just in general. So the people in the church who would have the best background would be Jewish men in terms of being able to teach the Torah. The one kind of questions that were considered rude, well, questions were kind, was the one kind that was considered rude was the unlearned question. Well, why would it be the women who are asking those? Paul gives short and long-range solutions. Short-range solution, stop asking disruptive questions in church because you're unlearned. You don't know. You, you, don't, you don't ask the right questions. You're slowing everybody down. Long-range solution, get some private tutoring to catch you up so your questions won't be unlearned anymore. They want to inquire about something. They should ask their own husbands at home. Now, the vast majority of women over the age of 18 were married. Special tax breaks for that and so on in the Roman Empire, uh, but that's another story. Paul wants their husbands to give them some, some private tutoring. Now, that may not sound very sensitive in our culture. I don't think Paul would have said it that way in our culture, but it certainly was in Paul's culture. Greek men averaged roughly 12 years older than their wives and viewed them as children. Roman men, the disparity, age disparity wasn't as great as that. Um, Corinth is a mix of, of Roman and Greek culture, official public culture, inscriptions in Latin, Roman culture, but the underbelly, you know, all sorts of people from around there in Greece said, you know, we have all these pottery fragments in Greek. Corinth was in Greece, naturally. Uh, Paul is writing a letter in Greek to Greek speakers. So, Greek men, on average, were about 12 years older than their wives, and most of them treated their wives as immature. The Greek moralist Plutarch is progressive by ancient standards. He, in his essay, Advice to Bride and Groom, advises the groom, Polyanus, take an interest in your wife's learning. <laughs> Even though most men think wives can't learn, I think they can. And then Plutarch ruins it. For if left of themselves, women produce nothing but base passions and folly. Paul doesn't ruin it. He's a bit more progressive, maybe like Xenophon, Rusonius Rufus. I mean, there were a few pro more progressive voices in antiquity. By the standards of antiquity, Paul is one of those more progressive voices. The problem in Corinth is not that women are teaching. Rather, it's that they're learning, or to be more precise, they're learning too loudly. 
Now, perhaps we should keep unlearned women from asking unlearned questions in our churches today, but following Paul's principle, perhaps we should keep all unlearned people from asking unlearned questions today. I mean, when I when I teach, sure, people people ask questions during during the lectures, but normally we don't have uh, people asking too much unlearned questions, because if the questions are too unlearned, I will say, you didn't do your homework, did you? You didn't do the assigned reading, did you? You weren't paying attention 10 minutes ago, were you? And that would be very embarrassing. I try not to do that to people. But anyway, the other possibility is that Paul is dealing with the congregation's respectability within society. Women normally didn't speak in public in front of other women's husbands. Paul says it's shameful, at least, at least in conservative circles. So women normally didn't, didn't speak in that way. Paul says it's shameful for a woman to speak in public. The Greek term that he uses was sometimes used of culturally shameful behavior. He may be concerned about the witness to unbelieving Corinthians, uh, which is an issue also in, elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, although the, the big issue in 1 Corinthians 14 is making sure you use your gifts in a way that's not disorderly. Um, now, some of the instructions he gives there, like two or three can prophesy and then let the others judge. Um, but he says you may all prophesy one by one. So how is that going to work? I mean, it's one thing in a house church. It's another thing if you've got a church of a thousand people. So you may say, well, you should never have a church that large. But if you're not going to say that, we realize that some things need to be adjusted. If you let everybody prophesy in a church of a thousand people, you'll be there for a long time. So, you know, some of these things are related to, to the setting that he's directly addressing with the expectation, hey, if somebody's going to listen in on this centuries later, we're going to have to adjust the application of the principles for the culture that we're addressing. Now, I know my mouth on the, on the video looks like it's all red. That's because the sun is going down. That's, uh, yeah. So I could, it could be my eyes that look red. Isn't that scary? Anyway, so please ignore that. But anyway, the other possibility is that Paul's addressing the congregation's respectability in society. But the application today would be different. In today's society, Restraining women's ministry would be a worse witness than women speaking, at least in my country, I think it is. So even keeping to Paul's intention, the application today should not be to silence women. You look at the pastoral epistles, and they repeatedly say things like, okay, the woman should do this so that God's name won't be dishonored. There's an apologetic issue to the culture that's involved. Now, the other text is 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. The whole context is 2, 8 through 15, so it's a worship context. It also gives instructions to men based on apparently what the men are doing wrong. Um, also tells women not to adorn themselves, so, you know, no earrings, apparently no makeup, things like that. Um, he probably doesn't mean none. Usually when people wrote like that in antiquity, they meant uh, don't overdo it. But anyway... The other text is 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Did you know this is the only text in the Bible that prohibits women from teaching? Well, if you were paying attention 10 minutes ago, it doesn't say they can't pastor. It may say they can't exercise authority or teach the Bible. That's, that's more of a debate. I'm not going to spend a long time on that because, the again, the evidence is so slender. <laughs> there are reasons why there's a debate on this. One could read, teach in such a way as to authenteo. What does authenteo mean? That's a debate also. Some say the term means usurp or seize authority. Even men shouldn't do that. Others say it means they shouldn't have authority. But there's also a grammatical debate about whether it's one or two prohibitions. Teach and have authority or teach in such a way is to have authority. The Greek actually can be read either way, 
and so it's a matter of debate. They usually held mo multiple elders or pastors for house church. So on average, back then, there may have been a pastor for every few families, maybe 10 or 20 people. So does that mean that women can't teach a Sunday school class with men attending? What's really interesting is, again, this is the only passage in the Bible that prohibits women from teaching the Bible. It happens to be in the only series of letters where we specifically know that false teachers were targeting women with their teaching. And again, I, I talked about this earlier, but is that a coincidence? Or might those two facts have something to do with each other? And again, almost nobody back then allowed women to teach. If the matter stopped here, there probably wouldn't be much debate about this today because everybody or almost everybody acknowledges the importance of cultural background. And nobody or almost nobody wants Paul to contradict what he said earlier. But Paul goes on to cite two biblical reasons why women shouldn't teach. First, Adam was formed first and then Eve. Second, Adam was not the one deceived. Eve was the one. The woman was deceived, and she became a sinner. So, people argue, Paul grounds this in his doctrine of creation. Women can't teach the Bible because Eve, hence women, are more susceptible to deception. Is that the point here? The first argument is that Adam was created before Eve. That was also one of Paul's arguments in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16, for why women should wear head coverings. Do women have to take a head covering and put it on to attend your church? And if you take that as cultural, why don't you take this as cultural when Paul uses the same argument in both cases? Further, does Paul mean this argument in an ad hoc way for the local situation, as many of us believe he does with the head coverings, or to cover, no pun intended, all circumstances? Paul often does make ad hoc arguments, even from Scripture at times. That's not usually how he argues from Scripture, but he does make arguments from Scripture like that. If we exegete Genesis on its own terms first, creation order does not say that women can't teach. Man and woman together are to exercise dominion over creation as God's image. You say, well, yeah, but God created, uh, God created the man first. Well, God created the animals before he created man. So if you're going to argue from that way, you know, the last created should be the greatest. We're not saying that, but hey. Um, man and woman together are to exercise dominion over creation. God makes for Adam a helper suitable for him, 2.18. Now, in Hebrew, etzer is a term of strength. It's applied to God more often than anybody else in the Bible. Suitable, the Hebrew expression here means corresponding to, not greater like God, nor in the context lesser like the animals. No, God creates one corresponding to him. Some protest, ah, but Adam names Eve as he does the animals. Actually, no, he doesn't do it as he names the animals until after the fall. Adam specifically addresses Eve differently, serenading her as one like himself in 2.23 and 24. He repeats the naming formula used for animals, 2.19 and 20, for Eve only after the fall in 3.20. And as we're going to see, the fall is kind of relevant here. People say, ah, oh, men have ruled over women in, in most of most cultures in history. And that's true. And the Bible gives us an explanation for that. Marital power conflict is part of the judgment. It's part of the fall. It's not part of God's blessing. It's not the way of the kingdom. So yeah, it's descriptive, but it's not prescriptive. It's not saying the way it should be. 316. Genesis, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. But that's the language of power conflict. The same construction with the same Hebrew words appears in only one of the text, and it's in the same context. So chances are it 
tells us something about the construction. Sin is crouching at your door, Cain. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must overcome it. You must rule it. In that case, he fails. But it's the language of power conflict. Should we promote the effects of the fall? Should we get men to sweat at work, like turn off all fans and air conditioners? And in terms of uh, the woman, part of the judgment on her is to, to have pain in childbirth. Well, should we encourage that pain? Should we never use pain relievers? And, and, and maybe we want to just increase it, uh, just to go along with the effects of the fall as much as possible. Get people to sin and die as much as possible. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating. I'm using reductio ad absurdum. But my point is, if this is an effect of the fall, it's not something God is encouraging. The creation order doesn't teach this. It came as a result of the fall. So I would argue that Paul's argument there is an ad hoc argument. Number two, his argument may also be ad hoc. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But look at Genesis 3.6. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. He was right there. He didn't seem to object. Eh, maybe, you know, maybe he thought, okay, if this is poison, I'm going to see, see what happens to her. I don't know. But anyway, we can take this either as a local application or a universal principle. I'm going to argue that based on Paul's usage, it's more likely a local application if indeed we attribute this letter to Paul, which most people who are engaged in this argument do. So the universal principle, Eve stands for women. Eve was deceived. Therefore, since Eve stands for women, women are deceived. Therefore, women shouldn't teach, except for teaching other women in Titus 2.4, whom, since other women are easily deceived, they may deceive especially thoroughly since women are easily deceived. Wait a minute, can Paul really mean that? If it's a local application, okay, so again, I'm using reductio ad absurdum, but if it's a local application, Eve stands for those who are easily deceived. The women in Ephesus are easily deceived. Therefore, these women shouldn't teach. Well, then we don't have that much tension with all the other passages we looked at earlier. In deciding the matter, Let's ask some questions. Are women more easily deceived than men? If Paul is making a universal argument, that's implicit in his claim. It implies women's ontological inferiority to men in ascertaining truth, which actually, when people want to appeal to the historic understanding of the church, um, that was the dominant view of the church in the Middle Ages and through most of history. Women are ontologically inferior to men in terms of ascertaining truth. That was the dominant view historically. I don't agree with that. Um, but I also don't agree with the dominant anti-Semitism in church history. And I also don't agree with those who thought we could be justified by, by works or other things. I mean, we express our faith in works, but uh, there, there are a number of things that were often held in church history that many of us today would disagree with. So uh, you don't have to say that women are ontologically inferior to men just because that was a dumb view in the church through much of history. If it's universal rather than local, then it's genetic rather than cultural. And it would have to apply to all women or it wouldn't exclude all women from teaching the Bible, which, as I think we can suggest based on other Pauline passages, Paul doesn't exclude all other women from teaching the Bible, certainly not from speaking God's message. Well, this should be easy enough to test empirically if it's true. There actually have been surveys that have been done, and in the surveys, you know, the the in terms of who is better at what, you can't predict in any given case who's going to be better, who's going to be worse. 
based on their gender. But in terms of slight trends, the study showed that women on average are slightly better on verbal skills, men are slightly better on math skills, which are better for preaching. Now the survey was done a couple decades ago, so I don't know, it may, it may have changed since then, but beyond the average, it's entirely unpredictable which do better. Now that survey involved, I think tens of thousands of people. My uh, case study survey, maybe between 500 and 1,000. So I've taught biblical interpretation for a long time. Uh, I taught biblical interpretation for most of my 15 years at the seminary where I taught before. And 40 to 50% of my students were women. And I tested on context skills. I tested on um, background research. I tested the kind of things you would test in terms of biblical interpretation. There was ac absolutely no way to predict who would do better in a class based on gender. That's in today's culture. So empirically, this would be a problem with that kind of test, at least in my limited experience of 500 to 1,000 students. Could Paul use the analogy with Eve in an ad hoc way? Well, let's look at the other Pauline references to Eve. He's got two clear references. There's, there's some that people think might be there, but two of them that are clear. 1 Corinthians 11.8. Adam was before Eve, therefore women should wear head coverings. Is that a universal argument or an ad hoc argument? Well, I'd have to digress and deal with head coverings, which I'm not going to do right now. I've um, done it other times and other places, and so you can probably look those up if you want to. The other, the other issue is 2 Corinthians 11.3, where Paul says, I don't want you to be deceived like Eve was by the serpent. So the same two arguments that are used in 1 Timothy 2, Adam was before Eve, and Eve was deceived, are used by Paul elsewhere. One, everybody allows women to come to church without their heads covered, agrees that's ad hoc. The other one, Paul wasn't addressing women specifically, he was addressing the Corinthian Christians which included men as well as women. In fact, when he writes to them and he addresses them, he addresses way more men than women in the church. So I don't want you Corinthians to be deceived like Eve was by the serpent. So Paul doesn't always apply Eve as a universal analogy for women. He does apply Eve to people who can be easily deceived, and it doesn't have to be women, which suggests that it's an ad hoc application. Paul sometimes makes ad hoc analogies for local situations. So why would we insist on this one text being universal and not some others? Again, not everybody agrees, but where we have to agree to disagree, let's do so in love as brothers and sisters in Christ and stop accusing fellow believers who really believe in Scripture as much as we do of not believing in Scripture including people like me, I believe, in Scripture. Do we apply directly instructions to first century churches, always? Or do we apply their principles for new settings? Slavery? Honoring kings? We apply the principle rather than reinstituting slavery or monarchy. Well, the same with the patriarchal version of marriage. I mean, 1 Peter 3, 6, call your husband... Lord, I don't know how many of us do that today. Do you think we should? I don't. The context in First Peter of that, going back to First Peter 2.13, where it goes on from there to talk about slavery and a certain form of marriage, for the sake of witness, he specifies in First, first Peter 3.1, he says, submit to every human institution. He's recognizing these are human institutions. It's part of the witness of the church. 
And you go back and you look at the household codes. Only Paul frames the household codes. These household codes were regularly used in antiquity. Paul is the only one we know of in antiquity who frames those with mutual submission. 521, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Chapter 6 and verse 9. And you slaveholders, do the same things to your slaves. Submit to them. Which is a good biblical principle. Jesus called all of us to serve one another. Galatians 5.13 we're all called to serve one another. Different cultures require different forms of these kinds of expressions. Head coverings were a form of gender modesty or sexual modesty in antiquity. Calling a husband Lord was a sign of respect in antiquity. Well, respect in marriage is a good thing and sexual modesty is a good thing, but we don't express it the same way in all cultures. So we could go on to talk about head coverings, but I think in terms of time, this is a long enough video. So um, thank you for bearing with me this long. And hopefully we love each other, even if, even if you disagree.